This afternoon, George Calancis uh, reminded us that the body of Christ is a transnational global reality. A couple of years ago, many of you were here for the theology conference where we talked about global theology as our theme for our entire conference. The book on that is on the IVP table. And in the course of our discussions in 2011 at this conference, uh, I made the argument not only of the importance and value of listening to the global church, but absolutely the necessity of it for us in the West to learn from our brothers and sisters around the world that any monocultural theology would be myopic and would need to have supplementation and in some cases correction from our brothers and sisters around the world. The interconnectedness of the church means that in the common pursuit of the service of God, we have so much to learn from one another. So tonight we have an opportunity to listen attentively and learn from a globally respected evangelical leader. There is great value, I think, in listening to a patriarch of the African church, someone who has lived out his faith very publicly in a very difficult context and at considerable risk to himself. To someone whose life experience as a Christian political witness has given him a message to share with us and someone who is a pastor who has done a lot of the things that we're talking about in this conference. Therefore, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker this evening, Archbishop David Guattari, the retired primate of Kenya in the Anglican Church. He'll be glad that I start by saying that he's married to Grace and they have three sons, all of whom live in Kenya. He studied theology at Bristol in England and worked for many years in the Ministry of InterVarsity and IFES amongst universities from Cairo to Harare. I think he's seen most of the universities between those two locations. And was ordained in 1972 and quite quickly became Bishop of Mount Kenya East, his home region from Kenya. And in that regard, um, founded a theological college. Think of some importance to our discussion in this gathering. During his tenure as Bishop of Mount Kenya East until 1990 and then Kiran Yaga until 1996, there was phenomenal church growth. He made evangelism a priority and led many missions in African universities. And those initiatives were combined with economic development, theological education, and liturgical renewal, the whole package put together cohesively. Four times he was chair of the National Council of Churches of Kenya, has acted as a mediator between the international evangelical and ecumenical movements, was a member in the 1980s of the Anglican Roman Catholic International Commission. This is a person who has done an awful lot and seen an awful lot. His pastoral work, indeed his compassion for suffering people, led him into political controversy. He preached and campaigned against land grabbing by powerful politicians, challenging economic injustice on a national as well as a local level. Bishop Guattari demonstrated the power of the pulpit to transform and reform society, in particular preaching against constitutional changes, or you might even say irregularities, that were part of his Kenyan political experience, especially the introduction of voting by a queuing system in which people lined up to be counted publicly behind their chosen candidate. And he led the opposition to the rigging of elections in Kenya on that basis, as well as condemning political assassinations and other undemocratic political practices. He had the courage to hold the government accountable for its actions and is still involved in upholding and defending human rights, most recently as a member of the Constitution of Kenya Review Commission. How fitting then that in 2009, there was a festschrift shrift in his honor, a collection of essays by various scholars. The title is marvelous. It's Religion and Politics in Kenya, Essays in Honor of a Meddlesome Priest. <laughs> we are delighted to have the meddlesome priest Meddlesome because he had a deep sense of being a faithful Christian witness in the context in which God had placed him. Thankful to have him with us tonight. He was Archbishop of the Anglican Church of Kenya until 2002. And I wanted to mention as well out on the book table, there's this 
lovely book of his, In Season and Out of Season, Sermons to a Nation. Many of the sermons that he preached in the context of the political turmoil of his nation are in here, and we've used them. I've used it as a textbook in classes. I've used it other places as well. A wonderful resource. If you're interested in the public voice of the church in situations of political conflict and difficulty, how do we appeal to scripture and draw to scripture? It's a marvelous example for you. So for all of these reasons, I think we are very honored and blessed to have with us tonight Archbishop David Guattari. How we'll proceed is he will give his address, and then we will have a time for a question and answer from the floor. I'll go up and sit with him and field those questions, uh, and at the end of the evening, a few announcements, and we'll be on our way. So join me then in welcoming Archbishop David Guattari. for being invited to come to Britain to be one of the speakers during this uh, conference. The last time I was in USA, can you hear me? <laughs> ah, yes. Okay, the last time I was in USA was uh, one week after uh, 11 September. 22001. So I was invited to go and be one of the speakers at the conference of the Anglican bishops at Vermont. And I changed the planes at Boston. On our way back, we flew in a plane, a plane with a capacity of 37 people, but we were only two. And the lady who was uh, telling us to tighten our belts told us to tighten our belt on a microphone. And uh, I thought she could have done better by coming to whisper to us. <laughs> I asked her, why are there so few people in this plane? And, and she told us it's the fear of the, the bomb or whatever. Uh, and uh, really, people were scared to travel by air at that time. I witnessed it with my own eyes. All the two passengers in an airplane of a capacity of that five. And so, uh, greetings from Kenya. Uh, from your brothers and sisters in the country I come from. The theme of our conference is Christian political witness, and I have chosen as sub-theme the ones you are in the world, but not of it. In the Gospel of John, chapter 17, which contains Jesus' high priestly prayer for his disciples, Jesus says, and I quote, I do not ask that you take them from the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. End of the quotation. These verses may be summarized by the statement that Christians are in the world, but not of it. It's a simple formula and it adequately sums up the biblical view. This verse is a good starting point of the general theme of this 22nd annual Whitton Conference. Following the example of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Christian is called to live for the kingdom of God and at the same time to be involved in the affairs of this world 
in which we live. Yet, this is exactly where the problem begins. Does this being in the world, but not of it, lead, lead it to a maximum political commitment or to a minimum one? In the early church, the Thessalonian Christians were so committed to the coming of Jesus Christ that they had even give up, given, up, given up work. Paul rejecting that extremity of detachment. On the other hand, the Corinthians believed that freedom in Christ gave them license to do anything they pleased. All things are lawful, they said, but not all things are expedient, replied Paul. Martin Luther, uh, Martin Luther struggled with this issue, and he thought he resolved the problem by his concept of two kingdoms. The kingdom of heaven, he taught, is the universal church of Jesus Christ. The task of the church is to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. The kingdom of the world, on the other hand, is the common social and political order governed by law and concerned with the restraining of evil. It is business in lawmaking. Its business is lawmaking and is concerned with restraints of evil. The two kingdoms are quite separate in their reasoning to be and in their concern. If the church interferes with the political order, it goes beyond its law of providing the community's preacher. Its sole business is preaching the good news, so says Martin Luther. In the like manner, the state has no responsibility of preaching. It is there to make laws and thereby to restrain evil in to restrain evil. Uh, how do you turn it around? Yeah. Yes, it is there to make laws and thereby to restrain evil <coughs> in the community. Luther felt that it is essential that these two roles be kept separate. John Calvin, on the other hand, felt uh, 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 had allowed a less clearly defined demarcation between church and state. Calvin wanted power in the church to exercise ecclesiastical discipline over its members, with authority to punish, so the church strayed into the area of lawmaking and law enforcement. Calvin's concern is the question of how Christians must view and led to it. He rejected the view of Anabaptists that the state is unclean and therefore Christians must abstain from any contact with uh, lawmakers. Calvin states that the state is created by God and it is he that has called magistrates to their function 
to serve divine justice. As a result, the state has legitimate rights to impose the penalty of death, to raise taxes and wage just and necessary wars. Um, Calvin's theology expounded the lordship of, of Christ as king and gave common points of reference to both the church and the state. This has led the reformed tradition to come much closer to urging the community to do its role in response to the core of the kingdom of Christ. Lutherans, on the other hand, cannot accept that the church has any direct responsibility to the kingdom of heaven. Now, in August 1976, a conference on church-state relationship was organized by the World Council of Churches and Ecumenical Institute of Bosse in Switzerland. The conference provided a useful outline of four possible attitudes of churches to political powers. First, the church adapt themselves actively when they identify themselves to goals and intentions of the powers of states. Two, the churches adopt themselves passively when they withdraw into sphere of pure religi religious and abstain from any political involvement. Third, the church can engage in critical and constructive collaboration with the powers of the state by evaluating on the basis of their understanding of the gospel, political decisions, and proposed programs. And fourthly, the churches may be led to resist the power of the state. The obligation to resist which may arise under certain circumstances has no destructive intentions. The attitude of resistance will be adopted to serve the society and even the state, because the state as well is called to be the servant of God and of the people. Now, a response to this statement from Bossi. The first category of churches which adopt themselves actively when they identify themselves to the goals and intentions of the power of the states is a very dangerous position to take. When the government is overthrown by military coup d'etats, the church suffers together with the states it supported. The best, uh, the best example is that of Ethiopia. The Coptic Church of Ethiopia worked very closely with the government of Emperor Haile Selassie. The closeness of the church and the state were symbolized by the fact that the thrones of emperor and that of the hand of the Coptic Church were placed side by side in St. George's Cathedral in Addis Ababa. When the communists came, they killed both the emperor and the head of the Coptic Church. The second option, that is where churches adopt themselves passively when they withdraw into sphere of purely religious and abstain from any political involvement. Uh, that is another very dangerous position for the church to take. Such churches should be reminded that even silence is a political decision. The members of East African Revival in, uh, uh, adopted that position 
in Uganda and the other East African countries. They were totally uninterested in politics. Their desire was to go to heaven. So when Indi Amin took power, overthrew the government of Milton Obote in early 1970s, the Christians were so naive that they even offered prayers of thanksgiving at Namirebe Cathedral to thank God for the coming of Idi Amin. Before long, Idi Amin, a Muslim, started persecuting Christians, which culminated to the assassination of Jenani Uwum, the Anglican Archbishop of Uganda. This was a country which had 80% of its population uh, considered as Christians, but they were not, majority were not interested in politics. So this 80% allow themselves to have a Muslim dictator and the consequences were bad for the state as well as for the church. The Bosa Conference stated that churches engage in critical and constructive uh, and constructive with the state by evaluating on the basis of their understanding of the gospel, political decisions, and proposed programs. In this case, the church can praise and support the government when its activities are in accordance with the gospel of Christ. When they make decisions which, contra uh, which contract, uh, contradict the gospel, then the church should courageously uh, crit uh, crit uh, and critically cri uh, criticize their governments. The government is likely to listen to those criticism because the church has been working with the state in the programs that are not contrary to the gospel. The fourth option, the churches may be learned to resist the power of the state. If the power that, uh, if the, the powers that be becomes autocratic and ignore the universal human rights, then the church can, uh, can uh, uh, that what the church can do is to resist uh, such, uh, uh, such a state. During the struggle for uh, against apartheid in South Africa, it was actually the church which played the, the main role in opposing apartheid, led by Bishop and later Archbishop Desmond Tutu. They led the struggle for liberation and eventually South Africa became free from apartheid. Taking of arms to fight autocratic regimes should only be done when all other means of bringing the desired political change have failed. A good example of disobeying authorities is when Peter and John, the disciples, were ordered not to preach in the name of Jesus by the Saint Hendrick. They answered, shall we obey God or you? This may be called, uh, this may be called holy defiance. This gives me opportunity to share with you my own experience in seeking to understand church-state relationship. I was brought up in a conservative 
evangelical tradition. As the Church Missionary Society of England sent missionaries to my part of the country, and the missionaries were from conservative evangelical tradition in the Anglican Church in England. CMS discouraged Christians from being involved in politics. This position was enhanced by East African revival, which began in Rwanda in the uh, early 30s, quickly, uh, quickly spread to Uganda, Kenya, Tanzania, and Burundi. The movement has, for the last eight decades, challenged sinners to accept Jesus Christ as their personal savior in preparation for his coming again. However, the East African revival movement has been more or less an inward-looking spiritual movement concerned more about the kingdom to come rather than participating in the kingdom which Jesus Christ came to inaugurate here on earth. They are concerned with their own individual souls that they show no concern for the corrupt and sinful world around them, except to invite the sinners to come out of their sinking ship and join the lifeboat of the brethren. They discouraged those who are born again Christians from getting involved in politics. The movement fits well in the second position of Bosse Conference. Then, as uh, the person who introduced you told you, I went to study theology in Tyndale Hall in Bristol, England. The college was committed to the conservative evangelical position. The syllabus, the syllabus did not include a subject on church and the politics. When I was ordained a priest and consecrated a bishop, I struggled to understand my ministry as a priest and a bishop in a country ruled by imperial and autocratic presidents who cared little about justice. Just before I became bishop, I was privileged to attend and participate in the International Congress on World Evangelization held at Lausanne, Switzerland, in July 1974. The, the, Congress, uh, the Congress theme was Let the Earth Hear His Voice, and was sponsored by Dr. Billy Graham and was attended by 2,700 participants from various parts of the world. At the end of the Congress, we agreed on a Lausanne Covenant, which was edited by John Stott. The Covenant has a cross on Christian social responsibility, which reads as follows, and I quote, we affirm that God is both the creator and judge of all men. We therefore should share his concern for justice and reconciliation throughout human society. Because mankind is made in the image of God, every person, regardless of race, religion, color, culture, class, sex or age has an intrinsic dignity because of which he should be respected, not exploited or eliminated. Here too, we express penitence, both for our neglect and for having sometimes regarded evangelism and social concerns as mutually exclusive. Although reconciliation with God, with man is not reconciliation with God, nor is social action evangelism, 
Nevertheless, we affirm that evangelism and social political involvement are both part of our Christian duty. The message of salvation implies also a message of judgment upon every form of alienation, oppression, and discrimination, and we should, be, we should not be afraid to denounce evil and injustices wherever they exist. End of quotation of a clause in Luzanne Covenant. I left Luzanne with much joy that evangelicals, conservative evangelicals from all over the world had, had at last repented for having put a wedge between evangelism and social responsibility. After the Luzanne Congress, it became necessary for the conservative evangelicals to define a relationship between evangelism and social responsibility. Again, I was privileged to attend a conference, a consultation held in June 1982 at Reformed Bible College Grand Rapids, Michigan, and attended by 50 theologians. The consultation concluded that there are three, there are three relationships between evangelism and social responsibility which are equally which are equally valid. One, Christian social concern is a consequence of evangelism. Two, Christian social concern can be a bridge to evangelism. And three, Christian social concern should be a partner of evangelism. Soon after becoming a bishop of the church, I found it necessary to study the biblical foundation and justification for Christians to be involved, not only in evangelism, but also in social political involvement. My conviction summarizes that the church should be involved in social political activity. My position is based on five doctrines. The doctrine of creation, the doctrine of humanity, the doctrine of incarnation, and the doctrine of the kingdom of God and the ministry of the Old Testament prophets. I do not go, want to go into details of my study on these uh, four, uh, five doctrines, but they are, they are the ones who, which, which gave me the encouragement to feel it was quite an honor for an evangelical, conservative evangelical to be involved in the politics and political situation in our country. And so um, I would like to now move on and give some concrete examples of our involvement in uh, political activities of our country. Uh, <clears throat> Now, in the doctrine of um, incarnation, Jesus assumed human form and took up residence in this world, prepared to take part as a perfect being in every sphere of life with the hope of bringing salvation to the world. In his other life, Jesus did not live in ivory tower of meditative asceticism, like the Quorum community or the early Christian monks. He went out into every city and every village, as Matthew tells us. And Jesus went out about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, 
preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every infirmity. When he saw the crowns, he had compassion on them because they were harassed like sheep without shepherd. By going out where people were, he was able to see with his own eyes the plight of the people and to make statements which the politicians of the day would have considered as highly political and provocative. When he saw the crowns, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. The crowns he saw were harassed politically as they were under Roman colonialism, they were harassed economically as the rich were making themselves richer at the expense of the poor, and they were harassed religiously as the Pharisees were putting unbearable burdens on the people. They bid heavy burdens hard to bear and lay them on men's shoulders, but they, they themselves will not move them by their finger. Now we were given quite a lot of um, information about the kingdom of God. Uh, this afternoon by the first two speakers. And I think we have had quite a good dosage of the kingdom. <laughs> and so I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll jump that uh, uh, section. And of course, the Old Testament prophets are a great inspiration, especially because of the courage that they had. Uh, and they, they, they always begin by saying, uh, uh, by, 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 by quoting what God has said. Once a prophet is sent to prophesy, he has no alternative than to go and say what God tells him. And you cannot be a prophet if you are a coward just as you cannot be a bishop who is a coward. A coward a bishop is a contradiction in terms. And so, uh, armed with this uh, encouraging uh, understanding of the scriptures and coming from the tradition of uh, evangelical, uh, conservative evangelicals, I found uh, sufficient courage to uh, be able to uh, prophesy in my own nation, Kenya. Now, in Matthew chapter 25, Jesus said that at the end of the time, those who will possess the kingdom of God are those who on this earth feed the hungry, give a drink to the thirsty, give hospitality to strangers, clothe the naked, care for the sick, and visit those in prison. When, God will, uh, when God's will is done in response to the needs of the poor, then they themselves have a taste of the kingdom. And those who respond to their needs qualify to receive the kingdom to come. But not the cries of the present poor. I was hungry, and you appointed a, you appointed a commission to inquire into my hunger. <laughs> I was thirsty. I demand Coca-Cola to exploit my thirst. I was a stranger, 
and you put a sign outside your house, beware a fierce dog at the entrance of your home. I was naked, and you seemed to enjoy my nakedness and even took a photograph. <laughs> I was sick with AIDS, and you said you cannot visit a sinner. I was in detention without trial, and you feared to visit me in case you lose your political position. Because of your failure to respond to the needs around you, the Lord will say to you, go from me, you that are under God's curse, away to the eternal fire which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. I was hungry, but you did not feed me. Thirsty, but you would not give me a drink. I was a stranger, but you could not welcome me in your home. Naked, but you would not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, but you did not visit me. Now, when I became a bishop, uh, there were issues which were of great concern. I became a bishop in 1975, one of the largest dioceses of Kenya. Two political assassinations had taken place. Tom Boyer, a very talented politician, was murdered in 1969. J.M. Kariuki was murdered in 1975. And Robert Ouko was murdered later in 1990. In all these uh, political assassinations, it was clear that the people behind the killing were very close to the president of the day. And yet, nobody dared to challenge those who are behind the killing of these very able politicians. And uh, I was asked by Christian Council of Kenya to preach about um, the sanctity of, of human life based on our own national anthem. O oh God of all creation, bless this our land and nation. Justice be our shield and defender, and so on. And so I preach on National radio, live summons for five, uh, six days, five minutes before the main news at seven o'clock in the morning. And uh, um, I touched on what I meant by uh, the sanctity of human life. On the fourth day, I was invited by officials of the broadcasting uh, in Kenya. And I went there. I found a committee of seven people waiting for me. They kept me waiting for one hour. And then when I, I was called in, I said, good afternoon, only one person answered me. And then the chairman told me, your summons this week are so disturbing to the whole nation. And I answered him, if they are disturbing, then they have served their purpose. Because the gospel of Christ is very disturbing, especially to sinners. <laughs> then I asked the person who said they were disturbing, which part is 
particularly disturbing. Uh, they had they had taken my script earlier and read a place where I said the 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 cries of the blood of Abel has reached the heaven. And this is only what is disturbing the Kenyans. I say what I'm saying is this, Mr. Chairman. Every human being is created in God's image, and nobody should kill him or her. Mr. Chairman, you are created in God's image. No should, nobody should kill you. And you are vice chairman, and so on. And all that. When I came to the end, the chairman said, if that is what you are saying, continue. <laughs> <laughs> now, these assassinations have taken place. Commissions have been appointed to investigate who are the murderers, but uh, I am sure those appointing the commissions knew who the murderers were. A lot of money spent appointing commissions, and we have never been told there is the results of these commissions, the height of impunity in our country. Then uh, <coughs> President Daniel Arab Moy, when he became the president, he had a philosophy which he called in Swahili, Nyayo philosophy, or following the footsteps of his predecessor. And because uh, it, it, it sounded as if uh, it has no meaning, it was given some uh, meaning by saying, Nyayo philosophy means peace, love, and the unity. These are three very important biblical ones. And I studied the biblical meaning of those ones, and I wrote a book together with NSSK, National Christian Council of Kenya. And our conclusion was Kenya was neither peaceful, neither loving, and there was no unity. And when we published the book, I presented a copy to President Daniel Arab Moy in his state house. Then uh, in uh, 1982, the constitution was changed so that Kenya became a one party states. Before that, it was one party de facto. The Lankahart constitution was multi-party. But after the first election, the other parties dissolved themselves and joined the ruling party. And so we, uh, any attempt to start a new party would have been quite legal, but in, in, in June 1982, par a parliament passed a law to say there will be only one legal party that is coming. And so we had to start fighting the battle to return Kanu to the multi-party democracy. The, the battle took 10 years but eventually we won. But uh, Moi was, was also very clever, especially in the rigging elections. Uh, he discovered the best way of rigging is by voting, by queuing behind the candidate you want. So if there are three candidates, you stand here, and then your followers stand behind you, and then obviously everybody will see, because it's during daytime, the longest queue, and that will be declared the winner. Of course, no records were kept. 
So you go and you see who has won the longest queue. The person with 5,000 people. And then you see there was another one with the five. In the evening, you switch on the radio, and it says the one who had the five won the election. And the one who had 5,000 lost. And this became uh, the best way of uh, rigging election because uh, uh, you, you cannot check any records. The people who won the elections are the people the president wanted, not the one the people wanted. And that's why my brother Bishop Henry Okul said in that, in that sixth parliament, 75% of parliamentarians were selected, not elected. Now, We've, I was chairman of the Christian Council, and we fought against the queuing system uh, for more than 10 years. I was preaching against this every Sunday, and um, some people did not seem to be very happy with what I was doing. So one night in April 1989. My house was raided by thugs, and uh, they had come with a mission to come and kill me. And my family and myself, we climbed to the roof of the house and called neighbors, and these thug, political thugs were chased away. The matter received national and international uh, media reports, and Moy was not very happy with that, so he appointed a commission of inquiry into my problems. And uh, uh, within uh, two hours of announcing he's going to appoint a commission, they were there, four, four policemen. They came and they started an investigation into my problem and all that. And uh, I, I, they must have given Moy the report. He had said, once I get the report, I'll t tell the whole world the truth. Now, he retired the same year as myself. That is 2002. I told the nation that exact date when I retire, 16th September 2002, and asked Moy to tell us the exact date when he's going to retire. He never told us. Anyway, he retired without telling me who are those who had come to kill me. But I'm still asking him, because he's still there, to let me know who they were. And so we, uh, the people who, uh, in the church, who really, uh, uh, during the struggle, especially in the 80s, when everybody was silenced, only a few church leaders were willing to stand and challenge the governments for some of the injustices which, which were going on. Some of the churches, of course, uh, followed the, some of the um, methods which um, were stated by Bosse. Either they have become passive uh, or they become supportive of the government, whether they are doing what is right or not. Now, uh, before I conclude my presentation, I would like to say there is a, a big difference between social activity and social political action. Now, in Kenya, when the churches do what you may call humanitarian activities, 
such as building hospitals and schools and feeding the hungry and refugees and all that, the government is very happy. We are even congratulated. But when you ask the question of why is there hunger, you are told you are asking a political question and your work is not politics, it's preaching. Uh, whether they, uh, they call it politics or not, we have to continue asking why is there hunger and yet you say there is no food for everybody. It may be food is not equ equitably distributed and so on. And so uh, when we, we, we need to go beyond just humanitarian activities to uh, going to what we may call transformation, we need to go to the root cause of the problem. Now, um, the, the, there is a story of um, a factory which uh, where there were very many accidents happening every day. And some Christian humanitarian met to discuss what they can do about this problem. And they came with a conclusion that they should buy an ambulance and employ two nurses and park the ambulance outside the factory so that whenever someone is injured, is brought quickly to the ambulance, the nurses give first aid, they are dashed to hospital, the ambulance comes to wait for the next victim. And this went on for a long time until one day the, a member of the ambulance committee said, but why are there so many accidents in this factory? Why not we go inside and see? So they decided to go in. Now that going in is really taking political action. They went in, they found the machinery was very old, the place, the place was overcrowded, uh, accidents were inevitable. And so they took a political action by reporting to the authorities about this uh, uh, factory. So the authority came and, uh, and they supervised and they said either you close the factory or you enlarge the space and buy new machinery. They accepted the second alternative to enlarge the uh, place and buy new uh, machinery. And the accidents were minimal. Now the ambulance could be sent, taken somewhere else where it is more needed. So sometimes we need to go just beyond the uh, social activities to transformation of societies to find where is the root cause of the problem is. And that is taking political action. And we cannot avoid when there is something which must be done. Let me uh, close by quoting uh, Martin Nimola, who was a Lutheran pastor in Germany during the Nazi regime of uh, Hitler. He was a prominent Lutheran pastor. And he said this, in Germany, the Nazis came for communists and I did not speak because I was not a communist. They came for Jews and I did not speak because I was not a Jew. Then they came for labor unionists and I did not speak up because I was not a labor unionist. Then they came for the Catholics and because I was a Protestant, I did not speak. Then they came for me 
By that time, there was no one left to speak to anyone. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you. Thank you very much. We've got time for some, whoop, we got time for some questions. We'll take about 10 or 15 minutes for questions if you have some to address to the bishop. I'm reminded from his comments that the church's political challenges and social needs are different in different parts of the world and many things we take for granted cannot be taken for granted in other places. So I think putting these things in context is very helpful and I'm very appreciative. Comments, questions? Let me start out with one while folks go to the microphone. Your title was about being in the world but not of it. What have you learned is the real secret of not being of it? You've talked about the importance of being in it. And I'm just wondering, what have you observed and learned about the, the best ways or means of not being of it or being, in a sense, compromised by the context and its pressures and losing a distinctive faith? you have thoughts on that? Yes. Um. I think it really depends on uh, issues that we uh, we might be uh, addressing ourselves. If it is in the question of politics, it is very easy to be compromised by those who are in power. And this happens quite often where church leaders are given money so that they don't uh, speak against the leaders or they praise them all the time. And by, by so doing, they just become compromised. They have no voice to challenge the injustices uh, uh, which these leaders uh, commit. Being in the world really means we must live in this world. But being not of it, is that we should not live, we should not be um, uh, live in such a way that we have been compromised. As Paul says in uh, Romans chapter 12, that uh, you, uh, uh, he, he, he urges uh, Romans, As, uh, as, 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 as people who have been called to be people of God, not to be, uh, uh, to present their bodies as living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. And not also to be compromised to this world, to be molded, uh, as a, a, a person who makes pots and all that, he, he uses his uh, stuff to make whatever shape uh, he may want to make. So uh, 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 in a situation like that, this one, a Christian, wherever he goes, will not let the world, uh, he, he will not allow himself to be compromised to the standards of the world because he believes in Christ and he wants to testify to the standards that Christ uh, wants. I think uh, that's what I would say about it. Good, thank you. We'll start on this side. Um, in 07, there were a lot of riots after the, uh, after the election, the Kibaki uh, election. 
And, and recently now you've had a new constitution where there's been a lot of Islamic pressure and pressure from various countries, particularly on homosexual issues and, and a number of other things. Um, how would you advise us here in the U.S. that are facing some of the very similar things that you're facing there to um, stand up? Most, I'm a pastor and most of my fellow pastors do not want to have anything to do with politics at all. Um, I'm one that if you want to take my 50C3 away, you go right ahead. I'll just even be more political. What would you say to our churches to warn us about uh, issues that we're ignoring here? Thank you. Uh, it is very difficult for me to tell Americans what to do about their own uh, nation. Uh, but uh, as brothers and uh, sisters in Christ, I would urge you to not to let the world play the tune which you are going to be made to dance but you believe in uh, Jesus Christ, in his lordship. I assume you are conservative evangelical, so believe in the, in the one of God. I think we, we have to, uh, even if the world may not like it, we have to stand firm and remain true to the faith that we have inherited. Thank you. Over on this side. Archbishop, we might all agree that the church must challenge a government when it acts unjustly and immorally. But do you believe the church should also advocate for particular legal, economic solutions and policies to specific societal problems? What is the question? Should the church advocate for particular policies or solutions to social, economic, political problems? Now, I, I would ask uh, uh, which church? Is it the bishops or the pastors or the convocation of the church or what? Who is going to say uh, what line we should take? I personally do not feel as a bishop I should go on the pulpit and tell people on Sunday, you are going to elect so, so and so. Because that would divide the congregation. Not all the Christians who come to my church will necessarily agree with what I say. So the best way of dividing the church in a situation like that one is to start telling them uh, who to elect, what police to make, uh, to follow, and so on. What we can do, and that is what we did during this past election, is to tell people the kind of qualities they should look for in the election of the leaders that uh, we, we need to elect. We have actually very good guidelines from uh, uh, Exodus chapter 18, when Jezero told his son-in-law to choose people who are capable, God-fearing, trustworthy, and incorruptible, and then place them in various positions of authority and I'm telling them, choose so and so. So uh, that's what I would uh, say about that. Thank you. Thank you, over on the side. Uh, Archbishop, to take the question that was asked earlier, maybe to broaden it a bit, um, do you think that there are particular areas where um, the American church has either withdrawn or um, sold out to the powers, so to speak, um, and ways that it needs to uh, 
uh, change its course of action in terms of the, the political realm? Do you feel like there's any, because um, certainly for, um, you did a, a, a great job of explaining to us um, how, the, how the Kenyan church uh, and how you guys deal, uh, dealt with a lot of the, the corruption in the government, but do you think that there are ways um, in which the American church is not um, fulfilling its mission, maybe globally or, um, or on the scale of our country in particular? Do you want to answer that one? Can you help me to answer it? <laughs> he wants me to go where angels fear to tread. <laughs> The question had to do with the areas where the American church may have withdrawn, I think, or failed to be involved in the kinds of areas where it needs to be. Did you have any comments about that? American church? Yeah. Or do you want to just not talk about the American church? Well, of course, we, we had missionaries coming from America uh, and evangelizing some parts of Kenya and doing a very good job in uh, planting churches. Um, and uh, I would say they did a good job. Uh, the only mistake they did during the colonial days was to, uh, to, 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 to please the colonialists instead of joining us in fighting for freedom of our countries. Um, so they did a good job, but they did not help us enough in uh, liberating our, of our country, of course, Kenya was not colonized by Americans. Uh, we can blame the British more than the Americans. <laughs> Question over here. Dr. Guitari, thanks for coming to speak tonight. I have a question on our role. What should our primary role be in ministry? You seem to give us um, two different major roles. One is serving the poor and the oppressed and the needy which you called social activity, and the other was um, like speaking out against the government and correcting them there. What should be our primary role um, in ministry? Should it be serving the poor or speaking out? Like what should be our main focus? What should be our primary focus in ministry? Speaking out and proclamation or helping the poor? Is it an either or? Um, Does one have priority over the other? Good question. Um, as I, I, I uh, said, the outcome of the conference we had at Grand Rapids uh, was that uh, uh, there uh, our involvement in social activity can be a bridge to evangelism, or it can, uh, uh, Christian social concern is a consequence of evangelism. Christian social concern can be a bridge to evangelism, and Christian social concern should be a partner of evangelism. So, um, uh, I, I, I wouldn't say that it is either or. We are called to do, uh, uh, to do Christian duty. Of course, there are those who are going to be called to serve tables, uh, as the seven deacons were called, and then the apostles were to devote themselves to, to prayer and the preaching of the word. And we all, whether we are uh, ordained priests or not, we are on, uh, doing God's work uh, to build his church. Thank you. Thank you. We'll take that as our last question. Let me make one announcement and then I'll have a closing prayer for us. 
And the announcement is about for those of you visiting from other campuses who are looking for the housing matchup process to find where you're going to be sleeping tonight. Uh, your Wheaton host uh, and uh, our process for that will be at the registration desk after the session. So if that applies to you, go out to the registration desk and then the process will get you all sorted out. There's the survey on this session that if you are filling that out to again turn it in at the, at the back, uh, drop it off in the boxes at the auditorium doors, thanks for that. And let us thank Bishop Qatari for his time with us. And let me say a closing prayer and then we'll be on our way. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for a good day. We thank you for a day of stimulating conversation. We thank you for brothers and sisters. We thank you for the truth of your word. We thank you for faithful witnesses. Many years ago and even in the present day, those who live faithfully before you, who speak your word boldly, who have courage in their leadership and who love your people. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to be together. We thank you for our brother from Africa. We pray your blessing upon him and his family in every way. We pray that you would encourage and equip him for the ministry that you have called him to do. And Lord, as we go tonight, would you give us peace and rest and good health. Equip us for tomorrow. May we give you honor, praise, and glory in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 See you in the morning.